Now, it is usually not a good thing to find out that you have been made redundant at work, that your replacement has come in and that you have to train your replacement on your way out. So imagine that you're a regional king in the Roman Empire and the long-awaited, prophesied-about true king has been born. Now, none of us wants to put ourselves really in the shoes of Herod, and yet this thought exercise, that's what I'm asking you to do, because this is the situation in which Herod found himself after the birth of Jesus. Now, by the time these events took place in our passage, according to chapter 2, verse 16, Jesus might have been as old as two years. He might have been two years old by this time. When Herod asked, uh, roughly when the Magi saw the star, and then he orders the slaughter of every male child born in the last two years in the town of Bethlehem, it gives us a hint, a clue, as to probably how long it had been. And prior to the wise men's arrival, Herod had no knowledge of the king's birth. And so when the Magi showed up at his palace, they were looking for the king of the Jews, Herod knew that he had a potential problem. Even if this all proved to be untrue, even if it was just a farce, even if the Magi didn't know what they were talking about, Herod took the threat seriously. And so Herod is not so different from any king, or any ruler, really, who thinks his throne is about to be taken from him. You remember King Saul had a similar reaction when the Lord's favor departed from him and rested upon David. He was deeply jealous of David. He spent years pursuing David, hoping to kill him. And so it's no surprise that Herod was troubled by the news that the Magi bring. Herod, if you know anything about Herod, you probably know at the very least that he spent his entire life in political intrigue. This man was a master of politics. He knew how to orchestrate events so that his enemies were taken out and he would stay at the top. And so he knew how to work any situation to his own advantage. He had executed members of his own family, including his own children, so that he would keep his position as king of Israel. And so rumors that the Messiah had come, even if found to be untrue, could do damage to the kingdom he had built for himself. Herod knew a threat when he saw one, and he wasn't afraid to carry out mass killings if he thought it would help him keep his throne. As we work our way through the sermon today, I'd ask you to consider this thought. The kingship of Jesus threatened Herod, and it threatens us too. But the response of faith is simply to fall down and worship him. Let me say that again. The kingship of, Her of Jesus threatened Herod, and it threatens us too. But the response of faith is simply to fall down and worship him. The sermon is divided into three points. The first, in search of the king. The second, the disbelief of God's people. And the third, Gentiles worship Jesus. Again, in search of the king, that's the first point. The second, dis the disbelief of God's people. And the third, Gentiles worship Jesus. So let's consider the first point of the sermon, in search of the king. Verses 1 to 2 say that after Jesus was born, wise men, or magi, came to Jerusalem. They had seen his star in the east. They had followed it to the capital city of Judea. And when they arrived in Jerusalem, they asked, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? And they explained that they had come to worship him. There's not a lot that's known about these magi. There might have been a large number of them. Because verse 3 implies that it was a big enough entourage to attract the attention of all Jerusalem. There's nowhere in scripture that it says there were three kings, three magi. Probably that comes from the fact that they three types of gifts are mentioned as being given to Jesus, although that doesn't mean that there were only three gifts given to Jesus. Now these magi were most likely from Persia, where they served the king of Persia as astrologers. And in the book of Daniel, the magi, the sorcerers, the enchanters, and the Chaldeans are members of the king's court and are collectively referred to as wise men. The Magi saw something in the stars that drew them to Jerusalem. Now, there have been various theories about what they saw, all kinds of suppositions and theories. And I think a, a few years ago, there was talk that the Christmas star had returned. And one explanation is that it was a comet. Another is that it was Jupiter and Saturn coming together in a bright nighttime display. That doesn't explain how it was apparently so low to the ground. Whatever it was, we must not forget that long before this, God used a bright light to bring his people out of Egypt. God can do 
supernatural things. We don't have to come up with some sort of natural explanation for this uh, apparent star. And so God used something. We're not sure what it was. It could have been a literal floating star moving along in front of them. But he used something to reveal to the wise men that they needed to journey to Jerusalem to find the king of the Jews. Now, Matthew doesn't condone astrology, and neither should we. But we should take note of the fact that these, these men, pagans, God drew them to himself so that they might worship him. And so Jesus, he's barely two years old, and the mission to the Gentiles, which the Apostle Paul would carry out more fully, had already begun. The Magi's entrance into Jerusalem with their announcement of whom they were seeking took the people by surprise. This was the nerve center of Judaism, so the people would have expected to know something of this magnitude right away. No one would have imagined that the priests and the religious leaders didn't know that the Messiah had already been born. And that brings us to the second point of the sermon, the disbelief of God's people. Now, the Magi had logically chosen to go to Jerusalem. Even if they hadn't had this bright light guiding them, they would have gone there because Jerusalem was the capital of Judea. It was the religious center of the Jews. The king lived there. And so they expected to find the king of the Jewish people there in Jerusalem. And while the Magi were searching for the king, those who were in, posi in positions of religious and civil power were ignorant of his birth. God had chosen to reveal the coming of his Messiah to a small group of outsiders. Verse 3 says, when Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. Now, even if they were wrong, and the promised Messiah had not come, the Magi's arrival would remind the people that Herod was not their true king. He wasn't from the line of David. Herod wasn't even a Jew. He did not belong on the throne. It was his father's and his own political maneuvering that had led to his position as the regional king of Judea. But Herod knows he needs to take this threat seriously, even if it turns out to be nothing. And so as verse 4 says, he assembled all of the chief priests, all the scribes. He inquired of them where the Messiah was to be born. Herod did not even know the scriptures of the people he was leading. And so they quoted to Herod a passage from Micah chapter 5 too. We read this right before the sermon passage. And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. And verse 7 shows the shrewdness of Herod. He secretly brought the Magi to meet with him. He found out from them what time the star had appeared. And Herod would later use this information to determine the approximate age of Jesus and command that all male children in Bethlehem, two years of age and under, be killed. But his initial plan was much more subtle than this. In verse 8, he sent the Magi to Bethlehem, and he said to them, Go and search diligently for the child, and when you've found him, bring me word that I too may come and worship him. For Herod, the easiest way to deal with this potential threat is a surgical strike. He doesn't care if this child is the Messiah or not. Like King Saul, he wants the threat to his kingdom eliminated. Now, there are striking similarities between Saul's pursuit of David and Herod's pursuit of Jesus. Both Saul and Herod had sensed that their thrones were in jeopardy. Both David and Jesus were the Lord's anointed. And anointed is what the Hebrew word Messiah and the Greek word Christos mean. Saul and Herod tried vigorously to destroy the threats to their power. David and Jesus had to flee their own lands. David to various parts of the wilderness. Jesus and his parents to Egypt to get away from these threats. But God protected his anointed so that no harm would come to them. Now Herod is an extreme case. What's not so as extreme is that most everybody, especially we who are in our sin, those who are in their sins, they want to get rid of Jesus. Sometimes Christians, even Christians can get a little tired, it seems, of the constraints, those perceived constraints that we have on ourselves. And that's because Jesus is a threat to everyone who is trying to build his or her own kingdom. That's why some nations have tried to keep the Christian faith out of their country because of the freeing power of the grace that Jesus brings. But it happens at an individual level, too. I want to build my kingdom. 
But if Jesus is in my heart, I have to bend my knee to him. I have to acknowledge his sovereignty over my life. But I want to be the sovereign. Brothers and sisters, we are all little Herods doing everything that we can to protect our own little kingdoms. We just need to remember that Jesus came to set us free from tyranny, even tyranny of self. We think we're in control, but the truth is, unless Jesus is king in our hearts, sin is in control over us. That brings us to the third and the final point of the sermon this morning. Gentiles worship Jesus. Verse 9 says, after listening to the king, they went on their way. And behold, the star that they had seen when it, when it rose went before them until it came to rest over the place where the child was. Now, if you're like me, you read this verse, and you, get, you read this verse, you get fixated on the activity of the star. How does this star move from Jerusalem to Bethlehem? Is it, is it really high up in the sky? Is it down close to the earth? What is this light? But this verse should, should lead us to ask a different question altogether. Forget about the star. Why is there no mention of the chief priests and the scribes and the people of Jerusalem following the Magi to Bethlehem? Why is that? The smartest people in the room, as far as Judaism is concerned, the people who told Herod where the Messiah was supposed to be born, why aren't they going with the Magi to Bethlehem to seek out the king? These were the leaders of Jerusalem. They were the ones who supplied Herod with the answers about where the Messiah was born. They should have led the Magi on their six-mile trip from Jerusalem to Bethlehem. But these religious leaders were loyal to Herod's agendas. They had their own agendas. They had been appointed by Herod to their positions of authority. They knew. They knew who the golden goose was. The priests, the scribes, the ones who knew the scriptures better than anyone else, the ones who were actually able to hold the scriptures in their own hands, unlike the rest of the poor people. They didn't want a new king coming in and upsetting the balance of power. They had no interest in going to Jesus. They did not want a change of command. But the Magi do go. And verse 10 says that when they saw the star resting over the place where the child was, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. Now, by this time, Joseph and Mary and Jesus, they are not still in the stable. I'm sorry to tell you, your nativity scenes are wrong. There are no wise men in the manger. They'd moved into a house by this time. Verse 11 says that the Magi entered the house, and when they saw the child with Mary, they fell down and worshipped him. Well, this is the only appropriate response when people encounter King Jesus, and yet we don't read of this happening very often in the book of Matthew. The Magi offer gifts, gold, incense, myrrh that are appropriate for a king. It didn't matter that Jesus wasn't in the palace in Jerusalem. It didn't matter that he'd been born in a cattle stall, that he was living in obscurity and poverty in this small backwater town of Bethlehem. The details did not prevent the Magi, Gentiles and pagans, from worshiping Jesus. But even though scripture had prophesied that the Messiah would be born in Bethlehem, aside from the lowly shepherds, Jesus' own people paid no attention to his birth. John chapter 1, 10, verses 10 and 11 says this, He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. The chief priests, the scribes, they were the first people of Israel, besides the shepherds and the people the shepherds told, to know about the birth of the Messiah. They should have gone with the Magi to Bethlehem. They should have returned to Jerusalem and proclaimed Jesus as the true king of Israel. And instead, they declined even to investigate what the Magi said. But as a result, they failed in their spiritual leadership of the people of Israel. Jesus, who should have been widely received and worshipped by his people, was instead worshipped by a group of astrologers from a foreign land. Verse 12 says that the Magi were warned in a dream not to return to Herod, and so they went back to their own country, staying away from Jerusalem. The time had fully come for the Son of God to be born on earth, but it had not come time for him to die. And so God thwarted the plans of Herod by giving a revelation to the Magi to avoid him. God was protecting his son, his anointed but he was also protecting the Magi. It's safe to assume that Herod's, Herod had plans for them, just as he had plans for Jesus. Herod could not afford for them to talk about their visit to the king of Jews. 
This passage shows two types of responses that people have to Jesus. They either receive him as their king, bowing down and worshiping him, or they actively reject him. These are the only two responses. There is no indifference when it comes to Jesus. Jesus is either the stone that makes men stumble or he's the rock that makes them fall. He is either our king and our savior or he is our enemy. This is the great divide between faith and unbelief. Unbelief is not passive, it's not neutral, it's not harmless in an ultimate sense. Unbelief ultimately is hatred of Christ Jesus. Our response to Jesus is based upon who he is to us. And so if he is your king, you will bow down and worship him. If he's your enemy, then in unrighteousness, you will actively suppress the truth of who he is, as Paul says in Romans chapter 1. On which side of the divide are you? Well, being in church is a good sign. I'm glad you're all here. It's great to see you on this first day of the new year. But just because you are here this morning does not mean that you're not enemies of Jesus. You may be here because your parents made you come. You may be here because going to church is what you've done all of your life, but not because Jesus is actually your Savior and your King. If this is the case, if you don't actually believe in Jesus Christ as your Lord, repent, believe, put your faith in Jesus Christ. You might be here because you were drawn by God to the King of the Jews. Most of you, that's hopefully the case for you. You've come in faith. You have bowed down to worship Jesus. And so for those of you for whom that is the case, I encourage you to keep bowing down and worshiping him. Don't grow weary in your faith. The journey that you are on is far greater than the distance from Persia to Jerusalem to Bethlehem, but it is worth it. It's a lifetime journey. You don't get to drop your pack. You don't get to hang up your boots. You have to keep going. But your goal is the same as the Magi. You want to see your true king face to face, and you will. God's word promises that you will see him in all of his splendor and his glory. You will see him in his heavenly palace when he welcomes you in as his brothers and sisters. That is his gift to you if you believe in him. And that is good news. Let us pray. Our gracious God, we thank you for your most.